Thanks for joining us. I'm Harsha Subramaniam. Trust is an important ingredient in entrepreneurship in the developing world. And entrepreneurs who assume that they will have the same legal and institutional protection as their counterparts in the West may not succeed. So argues Professor Tharun Khanna of Harvard Business School in his latest book called Trust, Creating the Foundation for Entrepreneurship in Developing Countries. To succeed, he believes, they need to build trust within existing structures. And to understand how it's done, let's welcome the man himself, Professor Khanna. Uh, thank you, Professor Kanna, for joining us on Bloomberg Quint. Let me begin this conversation by asking you, why have you chosen to write about trust as being a, a central idea in entrepreneurship? Why, is, why do you think it's so relevant in developing countries more than anywhere else? You know, we've, uh, entrepreneurship is sort of the flavor of the month, if you will, in most of the developing world, fast-growing countries, whether it's China, um, parts of East Africa these days. Brazil is in a little bit of a tailspin, uh, and certainly India is a hot spot these days. But I, I sort of felt that most of the attention was uh, being devoted to individual ventures and trying to rationalize why so-and-so has had a good exit or so-and-so has had a good venture. Um, relatively less attention was paid to how do you build long-lasting, sustainable ventures that can affect tens of millions of people, maybe even hundreds of millions of people at a time. Um, so I began to reflect on common factors that I perceived as having been important in ventures that I've played a role in, uh, either as an academic or as an entrepreneur myself in, uh, in, in different countries, in Asia primarily, to a lesser extent in the Middle East and Latin America. And the factor that jumped out at me as being especially salient was that almost every entrepreneur talked about how important it was for him or her to come up with a position where they compensated for the mistrust in which they found themselves generally embedded. So if you think about developing countries, uh, the, you know, the prototypical developing country um, on, on the plus side tends to have pretty high growth rates. On the minus side tends to be relatively unstable, uh, characterized by volatility. It might be macroeconomic volatility, it might be political turbulence, might be currency problems. You look at Argentina today, look at Turkey, the Middle East. Um, and, and of course, you have erratic policymaking because the checks and balances of the policymaker are relatively less well thought through. And in that environment, it's very difficult to engage in meaningful, long-running uh, commerce, uh, co-investment with partners. Uh, people are just skeptical because you don't know what's going to change. So in that environment, an entrepreneur who sort of figures out from the get-go that co-investing in trust-building mechanisms, in addition to doing whatever he or she is doing, uh, I think that's the key to building something long-lasting in, again, an atmosphere of mistrust. So that's the reason why I focus on trust so much. Okay. Professor, now explain this to us. You're arguing that entrepreneurs not only have to create uh, the, the product or service, also create the conditions to create. Can you explain uh, what, what exactly you mean by that? Yeah, so this is, a, this, is, this is sort of the central idea of the book. You know, I'm sitting in my office at Harvard right now, and... Right outside my window, I'm uh, gesturing to it right over here, um, literally a stone's throw away, if I had a good idea today, uh, I could probably reasonably access uh, capital providers who, risk capital providers who are willing to take a chance on, uh, on, on my idea, partly on the strength of being at a reputable university, partly on the strength of a track record, et cetera. I can access talent pools. Um, this is a center of, uh, center of education and a center of... Uh, uh, all sorts of creative ventures. I can access accountants, market research firms, people who specialize in evaluating ideas, intellectual property firms, adjudication firms, dispute resolution. Everything is within a stone's throw. So the, the task of the entrepreneur in Boston, uh, just to pick the, the, the city that I'm currently sitting in, is not easy, but it's a lot easier than doing this in Bogota uh, or even Bangalore or even Beijing. Um, of course, these services that I just enumerated, um, you know, somebody might say we see them in Koramangla in Bangalore, uh, and that's true, but it's just the depth and sophistication of the supporting structures that I think will take some more time to come into being in, in, uh, in most of the developing world. So what happens then is that the entrepreneur is sort of competing with one hand tied behind his back, so to speak. He doesn't have those supporting mechanisms to help him. Uh, and that's the spirit in which I say that when you look at uh, people who have built long-lasting, sustainable ventures at scale that have lasted decades uh, tend to have realized that one of their central tasks is to not just, you know, 
ostrich-like hide their head in the sand about the institutional inadequacies around them, but to actually confront them as part of the entrepreneurial challenge. In other words, I want to be uh, you know, a medical device entrepreneur. Uh, it's fine. I should focus on medical devices, but I'm also going to have to do things about the fact that I'm going to need better intellectual property support mechanisms around me. I'm going to need better people who understand the science of medical devices around me and take active steps to cultivate that. Uh, so the book is full of examples of people who have um, sort of stumbled onto this or realized this early on and taken explicit steps to do this. And the reason that trust is important is that um, it's the thing that stitches together the collaborative effort that you need to engage in in order to create these conditions, which then allow you to create. That, in a nutshell, is the thesis of the book. So, Professor Kanna, you know, we're also talking at a time when trust and credibility of large corporations in India, at least, isn't quite high. Business leaders are accused of crony capitalism. Bankers are, are being accused of being too cozy, at least with rich borrowers. Governments are seen taking sides of industry when they're in conflict with the environment. So the larger question is of credibility, or trust, as you call it, uh, which is in short supply. So how can a startup ensure that he's trusted? So your, your observation is spot on. You know, uh, business has been pilloried. And even in my, uh, certainly, certainly in, uh, in India, it's rightly taken to task for um, often unethical, even illegal behavior in many instances. Uh, even in my adopted home country in the United States, um, reputation for business following the 2008 financial crisis has been at pretty low levels. And it's quite shocking to me that the social organization that is the primary creator of uh, wealth and comfort in the world um, has such a low reputation. Um, in fact, the only people who have lower reputation, I think, in the US than business people are, uh, are politicians. Um, anyway, but I think that's the reason why it's even more central to focus on trust. So if you're an entrepreneur, uh, what are your choices? You can either um, lower yourself uh, into the uh, into the proverbial cesspool and adopt an mistrusting and untrustworthy posture. And all my studies and analysis, whether you look at trust that's fostered through formal governance mechanisms or trust that's fostered through a commitment to quality above and beyond what the rules and regulations uh, require, or trust that's, that's created by building out the ecosystem around you, sort of the private provision of public goods, whatever the mechanism is through which you get to trust, it truly is the, the unique asset that sticks out that will distinguish you. So your choices are uh, dive into the cesspool with everybody else who is uh, you know, condemned to live in a low trust miasma and create something that, you know, frankly, may give you a little bit of money in the short run. Um, it's possible. It happens every day around us. I don't want to say that it's not possible. It clearly is. Uh, or if you aspire to a higher, a higher aim, uh, both in a commercial sense to, to build something that has long-lasting commercial value and to hire social goals, which I certainly do and my students certainly do, then I don't think that that course of action is uh, either practical or advisable. You're much, much better off doing what I'm suggesting here in a sense, um, uh, creating the conditions to create, fostering trust. And, you know, some people, well, lots of people tell me, that's kind of impractical. That's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm agreeing with you. It's not easy. The task of the entrepreneur in, uh, in, you know, in Bangalore and Beijing and Bogota and Bujumbura or any other places in the developing world is fiendishly difficult, much more so than Boston and New York and San Francisco. Uh, but I still think the approach that I'm talking about, again, if you want to build a venture at scale that affects tens of millions of people, you don't have a choice but to combat the mistrust around you in most developing countries by explicitly making that part of your business objective. And the book is full of examples of people who've done this practically, have done this at relatively low investment. Um, and I think what's really needed is a mindset shift to embrace this sort of dual objective function as opposed to saying, I wanna build, again, my example of a medical device company, and all I'm gonna do is do medical devices. You kind of have to build the whole ecosystem up with you. Sure. Let, let me challenge one more notion. You, you also say that entrepreneurship is a team sport and, uh, and the team and teaming with the state is crucial to both scale and have impact. Uh, in India, the narrative is the complete opposite. There is a trust deficit with the state, which is seen as either being inept or being corrupt. Uh, how can the, 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 can the government be good partners? Uh, I know you quoted Aadhaar as an example, and it is a good example of state-led entrepreneurial effort. But isn't that more an exception than the rule? 
Yes, it's, it is an exception. And that's why I'm focusing on it. Um, that's why these developing countries are remaining developing as opposed to developed, that we are stuck in some sense because of, you know, chasms of mistrust, if you will. And it's not just the one that you're pointing out, Harsh. It's not just between the public and private sectors. Um, I do a lot of work, uh, pro bono work with uh, different governments, including the government of India, and I'm very proud to do it and happy to do it. Uh, but, you know, the central challenge in all that work is bridging this this gulf of mistrust, if you will, between the public and private sector. So I'm acknowledging that. By the way, there are also other gulfs of mistrust, you know, between one of the things that I try to remind people of when I'm speaking to audiences in, in, uh, in India, by the way, less so in China, uh, is the gulf that exists between science and industry. You know, scientists don't trust industrialists. Uh, industrialists don't know how to talk to scientists. And that really is a, a, a gating function on our the rate of our progress uh, going forward in a very, very practical way. But let me come back to your, uh, to your question about the state. Um, look, I agree. Uh, but I think it's a bit of a... Um, if I wear my hat as a, a member of the private sector of civil society, um, uh, and, an, and an entrepreneur in these developing countries, uh, I would point the finger back to me. Not so much because the government is blameless, but because uh, I can control more about what I do than what the government does. And I think the onus is on me. Again, my objective um, is, is you know, not even a holier-than-thou type of objective. I'm just interested in how can I take my ventures and get them to scale. And as, at a very practical level, I need the machinery of the state to work with me. And so well, how would an entrepreneur approach this if he or she reframes the challenge in that way? I think the answer is you find willing people within the state who are desperate to work uh, in a more uh, performance-oriented mindset. And I have not yet come across a government, no matter how unstable, venal, corrupt, what have you, that, does, that is not populated largely by people who want to do good work. Um, so I think the... Um, there is a willing counterpart on the other, uh, on the other side, mm. probably trapped in its own machinery. And it's up to us, the entrepreneurs, to extend a hand and say, can we learn to work together in some way? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I do think Aadhaar, whatever, wherever one might come, come out with uh, privacy concerns and so, so on, uh, I think it's been an incredible, incredible accomplishment in a short period of time. It does represent a meaningful partnership between the private sector and the state. And I think rather than inadvertently dismissing it as an exception, I'm not saying you're doing that, but rather than doing that and saying, oh, there were some unusual circumstances that led to that, let's look at it and use it as an example. You know, I played a role, small role in, in helping set up the, uh, uh, underneath the Ayog in India, the Atal Innovation Mission, which I'm still very centrally involved with. And it's kind of patterned on the same idea, which is let's get people from the private sector involved with the state, find a way to use the machinery of the state to promote the infrastructure that supports entrepreneurship and innovation in India. Similarly, there are efforts on the health side that are ongoing, that different foundations, civil society members, academic institutions, entrepreneurs are working on in Delhi, Bangalore, other places. So I think that Aadhaar example has, uh, has, uh, has, has sort of uh, made people aware more broadly of a sure. mindset that needs to be adopted, which I wholeheartedly endorse. All right, Professor Kanab, we leave it there. Many thanks indeed for joining us and good luck with the book. Uh, if you have been, thank you so much for watching.